You are listening to 10,000 Swamp Leaders, leadership conversations that explore adapting and thriving in a complex world with Rick Torsett and guests. Hi, everybody. This is Rick Torsett, and this is 10,000 Swamp Leaders, the podcast where we talk with people around the world who've made a decision to lead and to lead in some pretty wild and crazy or what I would call swampy issues or innovative issues and opportunities. Today, my guest is a, a friend named Ann Gibbon. Ann has a, an incredible background, and she intimidates the heck out of me. She knows that. And uh, I'm going to give some of the highlights, and I'm going to let you fill in the blanks. You went to the Naval Academy from 1999 to 2003. You didn't just go to class and get a degree in English. No, 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 no. You were a two-time All-American rower. You set the rowing erg record for 2,000 meters. You won a national boxing championship, I believe. And they also saw fit, rightly so, to put you in the Naval Academy Sports Hall of Fame. And that was just the beginning. So <laughs> you have done some amazing stuff between then and, and now. You're working the Navy, your time on ships. But you've gone through several education experiences and it's formed up, I'm guessing, some points of view you have in the direction of your current life. You are the CEO and co-founder of uh, Matri Incorporated, mm -hmm. which I'm going to give you space to describe because it's really quite fascinating. And I think it's a, a thing to talk about in detail. So first of all, welcome to the swamp. It's so great to see you. It's been a while. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you, Rick. So before we get rolling, tell people what you want them to know about you for context. So I'd actually like to start with the people that came before me. My context is, or, or me, it's never far from like my grandparents' stories. You know, my grandmother was an immigrant from Mexico and left school in sixth grade. She had a really hard life. My grandfather was in the Navy in World War II. He was on a battleship when Pearl Harbor was bombed and spent the war on another battleship. My dad was a small business owner and... My room was next to my parents growing up. So I heard all the calls that he got in the middle of the night and it put into my brain, my subconscious about what it meant to be a small business owner when you're the last call. Like there's no one else that you can turn to, to fix things. And anyway, so I think you can't tell the story of my life without telling the story or acknowledging the people that, that made me. So you immediately provoke a connection. So was your grandfather's experience in the Navy part of what influenced you into the Naval Academy? Oh, for sure. And truthfully, what that experience did to him, he definitely had PTSD, he was a decently angry man, but he was around the water his whole life. He loved sailing. So I grew up near the Puget Sound. I grew up with stories of that, of his time in the Navy. He sailed around the world with also no GPS, like he did celestial navigation. So there's a stubbornness that was passed down through stories in my family. And then when I was at the Naval Academy, it was for sure influenced by them. And then my service in the Navy was influenced by him. He would copy articles about World War II and really about Pearl Harbor and the people they served with and that day. So when I was in the Navy, I was stationed in Pearl Harbor, actually on a frigate. Mm -hmm. And so I would always think about my grandfather's experience there. Okay. So let's go to uh, Annapolis, if you don't mind, for a little bit, because I suspect that has influenced you in a lot of ways, both pro and con. Yeah. Uh, so yes. for me, I'm curious, because we've never talked about this, 1999, what was it like to be a woman going into what historically had been a fairly male-dominated environment? And what did you learn about yourself in that process? And how did you learn to make your way and excel in that world? Yeah. Well, I'm really lucky. So there's been 23 years at that point of women at the Naval Academy. So it was absolutely accepted for women to be there. The difference was they didn't think that they could date you. And that wasn't true of everybody, but it was sure true of a lot of guys and kind of a, a feeling there. But it was totally accepted to be there and do that job. Still finding our way to be not one of them, but to not change who you were as a woman to fit in with their roles. So I remember hearing when I first got there, someone said, women are either bitches or sluts, so pick your lane. And that kind of angered me that that's how they would describe you. 
So I picked a third lane, and which was athlete. Uh, that really just influenced how I spent my time there. I put a lot of effort into working out and being an athlete and trying different sports. And that was my persona, partly because it's naturally me, but partly also because it was a, a safe thing to do. So you got into rowing, I assume mm -hmm. was one of the sports, was boxing. Did boxing come into your life at the Naval Academy? Yeah, I was very lucky. So there's a lot of mandatory classes at the academy. Obviously, you get a Bachelor of Science, actually. So I have an English degree with a Bachelor of Science. Same thing with the sports they make you do. So there's obviously a lot of swimming, there's grappling, wrestling, and boxing is one of the mandatory classes. And I did that my sophomore year. And the boxing coach, which is teaching the PE class, thought that I hit pretty hard and was aggressive. And he was refing amateur fights out in town. And so he was seeing the women who were fighting in the heavyweight class. And he thought that I could take him. So he sent his boxers to recruit me or he'd talk about it and think like, say like that mid Gibbon, like she can clean up. So if you guys can get her to come to the team and my senior year, I switched from rowing to boxing and became the, the first woman to box at the Naval Academy. The first woman to box at the Naval yep. Academy. Yep. So there is a video online of you giving a talk. Mm hmm. And I want you to give, because uh, we're going to attach that link in the show notes so people can watch okay. this, okay? But give a, little, give a little tease to people about what they're going to see, because this is a pretty outstanding video in multiple ways. And that's not Naval Academy video stuff. This is more present day. So what, what's on that video? Where did it come from? And what was your thinking there? Yeah, that was nine years ago now, but I'm 42. So it was 10 years after the Academy. So I was asked to give a talk that was TED Talk-like. So I had about 20 minutes and they impressed upon me that they didn't want you just to come up to the stage and chat. They wanted you to do something. They'd had people you know, swallowing swords and stuff and speaking from a bathtub. So one of my unique things is that I'm a female boxer and I'm not small. The, the national amateur championship I won was in the heavyweight class. So I asked a local boxer to come hold mitts for me in the beginning of the talk is me working the mitts and throwing punches. And then I go behind the stage and change into a dress and heels because the point of the talk is about design and what it means to do that work. And for me, one of the big aspects is being able to push yourself to extremes of thinking and curiosity on many sides, not just what makes where you feel comfortable or one of them. And to have this like balance to me means extremes in many forms of curiosity and exploration. And so the female boxing mixed with wearing a, a black dress and heels was my visual speaking version of that. And I'm going to affirm for people who watch this video that you pull that off. And I also was thinking you have to be a somewhat stout guy to take the punches that you were throwing at him as well. I couldn't yeah. do that. Okay. So when you leave the Naval Academy, you don't leave education and development. You, you track yourself along the ways a few stops to expand your knowledge. What were you pursuing there? Not just specific content, but what was it that you were trying to achieve or where were you going on that journey at that point? I've always been obsessed with leadership and decision-making since my dad would, he loves giving advice. It's probably genetically passed down to me too, but he would make us sit down and listen to him as kids and he'd take his glasses off and, you know, we'd have to stand there kind of at attention. And he'd tell us stories about his day and, and how he took care of his team. And he had people who were doing near minimum wage work in a gas station and it's not glamorous or fancy and you wouldn't expect perks or your boss to like care about you a lot. But he would tell stories about the 19 year old guy who worked in the convenience store, was becoming a first-time father, wasn't planned. And my dad talked to him about that, but then he found a parenting class at a local community center or library. And he made that guy go and he, you know, worked with the manager and made sure his schedule fit so that he could go to that parenting class. But he like stayed on him. You know, it's like, no, you're like you're you're leaving now to go to that class. Cause it's really easy sometimes when you're young to not do the things that you know you should do to better your life. And I saw that my dad used his power for good in a way that didn't have anything to do with his business, but he cared about people. And so I was always so passionate about that work in the military of how can we be better leaders, which to me meant how can you be better at using your power for good? 
And then the business side of what I watched with my dad is how could he be better at the decision making of the business? Because when it improved and grew, he could not just keep it open and pay people and create more jobs, but you know, he could increase the bonuses and that kind of stuff. So I loved that work of a leader, that the skill of your decision making in that whatever job or space you're in, plus the ability to use your power for good could be life changing. And so I've just, I would like go to Barnes and Noble and read leadership books at night when I was a young officer. Right. So, so let's get into the leadership part for a little bit. And I want to come to your present day and, and the work that you're doing, because I, I suspect that these all start to come together and form up in a, in a direction here. You went to the Naval Academy. They spend time on leadership. Uh, you <laughs> stayed in that conversation for a while. You're still yeah. still in that conversation. So let's, let's start with a basic for you. What is leading, in your opinion, after all this time? That you have to bring into it emotional self-regulation. And I say that first because when you're a leader, and I, I think we've all established by now, it, that's not necessarily an appointed position where you're the one in charge. Anybody can choose to exercise leadership. But if you do that, if you start to exercise leadership, which means you're trying to influence others, you absolutely have to be able to self-regulate because once you're in that position of leadership and influence, if you take out your fears and your anger on others, it's a non-starter for me. I hate seeing that. But then once you've worked on yourself, I think it's two things. It's don't ask others to do what you wouldn't do and using your power for good. Right. So to expand using your power for good. How do you do that today in your work? I think about it now as a, I'm building a company instead of a startup. When I think about the scale of what I want my company to be, one of the reasons that excites me about doing a startup is I can set the culture from day one. Mm -hmm. And when you're managing a bottom line and there's a finite amount of resources, or it can feel like that, it's really easy to take shortcuts in how you take care of people. So power for good in a very tiny, simple way means looking for ways to create opportunity for people that would have easily been looked over. So something small is there was a woman who worked for me and needed some time off for mental health issues. But instead of just leaving the company, we worked with the HR company that we use and made sure that she had health care. And we found one of the like exemptions or kind of labels that we could use where she didn't have to work, but she could keep her health care. And I think you can make the system work for you. So I think using your power for good means keeping your eye not on what is normally done or a routine path. So like, okay, you're going to leave the company or whatever, and you're gone. And oh, that's too bad. You don't have healthcare anymore. It's what's the end goal. It's always to take care of somebody. And so we're going to figure out a way to do that. And there's usually always a way that you can manage a system to find an opportunity to help somebody. Good. So you are in a startup mode right now, yep. which is its own challenges so talk a little bit, if you will, about what your idea is. What is the business? What is it you're trying to impact in the world? And where are you in this process right now? So there's a few questions there, but hopefully they're sequential for you. Yeah. I met my co-founder 11 years ago. So he's been a friend for a long time. And about four and a half years ago, he asked me if I wanted to build his ideas into a business. He's an MD and a PhD in neuroscience. So he's the genius behind what we do. So over the last couple of years, as we've worked on this, like what is this thing that we're making? His core ideas are around how we improve the interaction between humans and machines. So what we want to do over the next 20 years is revolutionize how humans consume and use information. So it's a massive ridiculously huge paradigm changing thing that we've set for ourselves. So we've been doing this, or I've been thinking about this for a long time, because literally within seconds of meeting him, he was showing me some of the demographic software that he'd been working on at that point. And I knew within seconds that this had the potential to totally change the work that we were doing. And then that time I was still in the Navy and I was working on counterterrorism ops and I knew that the conversations we were having, the planning we were doing would be dramatically improved if we had that tool. And I was frustrated that we didn't. And so I've stayed in touch as a friend because I wanted to hear about where that tool was being built so I could use it in my work. And then it hadn't yet. So our startup is small. It's a handful of people, but 
I've been obsessed in thinking about this concept and framework and how to turn it into a product, multiple products, but like, what's the first one? How do we use this? So I'm 11 years in-ish. I'm four and a half years in from explicitly working with my co-founder on building a company and figuring out that roadmap. And I'm probably 20 years away from achieving what we want to achieve. So uh, people listening are probably intrigued, but they may not yet have a full understanding of what the point of the exercise is here. So Mm -hmm. where is it right now? What are you trying to do when you say, talk about this interface in people and technology? So how do you make it better than it is? Maybe let's start right now with what you perceive in your own experience the condition that we are in right now and what the issues are there and how what you're working on can make my life better in some way. Yeah. So there's the really cool 3D graphic stuff we're doing, and I don't see anybody else doing that. There's other things that my co-founder has worked on in research and his his thesis, and he's been funded for different R&D contracts by the military and Intel community over the years. But the point of all that is better leadership, better decision-making. And in order to make better decisions, we need to use all this data that we've gathered, which over the last 30 years has been revolutionary about the sensors we have and how much data we're able to capture and store and move around in better and better ways. So now the question that I believe, not the question, but the thing that stops us from using data more effectively is the interface, how much we see. So right now, we think that it's like a straw. So whether you're looking at a dashboard with scatter plots or trend lines or like a wearable app interface trying to look and make sense of your data, you're not seeing at, like it's just like a tiny straw of what's available to you. And our brains are so incredibly capable of consuming huge amounts of information through our sensory system, whether that's the visual cortex our body, like you think haptics, our nervous system and brain have this incredible capacity to consume information. We have all these stores of data. It's the interface between them that has not been fundamentally innovated in several hundred years. And I say fundamentally, I know there's like challenges to that in different ways, but we're still using histograms as an example, as a chart type, pretty commonly. And histograms were common. Like I have a picture in my pitch deck of histogram from 1821. So the volume and depth of data that we're showing people in our data visualization interfaces now, whether that's an app interface for like wearable data, or it's a a business intelligence dashboard that businesses would use, it is incredibly small compared to what our brains are capable of receiving. And so... Where are you in this process now? I mean, are you experiencing uh, a sense of progress, making headway? Yeah. Oh, man, it's been a road. When I was talking with investors a year ago, I would get the feedback, this is interesting, but is this an R&D project or is this a business? And I would get frustrated, but that's because it's my process for like generating the energy to like keep going in a direction that is often new. I've always done like new things. Started different departments when I was in the Navy or teams. And I was, anyway, I'm used to being the first one. So one of the things that I do is I allow that internal sense of frustration and anger to not be just a swirl that keeps me in one spot, but it powers me to go. I I know, I feel that there's some truth here. So I knew I wasn't doing a research project because we wanted to build products that people use and take this idea to the world. But it took me a long time to really grasp what my co-founder was doing. I think it's as fundamental as a theory, a companion theory to Shannon's theory of information, which he was the person that came up with bits and zeros and ones to describe information moving between machines. So this communication theory, what I think my co-founder did was describe the equivalent of that, but how information moves between a machine and the mind and back. Mm -hmm. So it took me a really long time to grasp my mind. And we had some military R&D projects, but where we are now is finally building a product for businesses. And so we're starting with pro sports teams. And 
turning this concept of how do we move more information into something that they use every day without having to think about all that. Like our job is to be the nerds and people who obsess about decision-making process and make a product that's so easy to use. The people that pick it up, like a scout, only has to think about the things that they are already doing. Like I'm going to a game, I'm going to watch players. So like our product should be useful to them. And they only have to think about where's the section that helps me monitor players. Cool. There's already a design. There's already prompts. I can just use it and do my job better. So we're at the point where I've wrapped my mind around this and we've mocked up the product. And now we're testing the prototype with people in pro sports. So I'm curious then, because you, you'd mentioned when I asked you about what leading is to you, one of the things you said is that it can come from anywhere. It's not a role. It's not a position. It's a it's a choice and a decision. Raise your hand, decide to go. I know yeah. that for you, most of the forks in the road you've chosen to take have been based on the harder work and the challenging work and the more interesting opportunities. So you've, you've got a track record of leading yourself. Yeah. So for people who are listening, talk a little bit about what you've learned about raising your hand, what the consequences of that, what have been the lessons learned. And if you have counsel for people who are timid, what is that counsel? So we met through a mutual friend. He's a Navy SEAL and he rose to some of the the highest positions of leadership in that community. And that I was at a serving at a SEAL team in my last like time in the Navy, last year and a half. And when I got there, so it's the one of the tier one units. So in the Navy, they do some of the most elite work of all the special forces teams, like and even beyond kind of quote the regular Navy. So when I got to that team, I had never been in Naval Special Warfare before. I served on ships and I was on shore duty. So I was teaching at the Naval Academy, but I hadn't been exposed to any classified material because I was teaching at the Naval Academy. And so I get to this team that is on the tippy tip of the spear of our military. And I've never been in that world before. So I don't know their acronyms and language and planning. And I hadn't been reading classified material in a long time. So I wasn't up on a lot of different things. And literally when I got to that job, the only thing valuable that I could contribute at 30 years old was changing the font size on PowerPoints. And I'm not being dramatic. I remember that feeling. I was sitting in an ops center as like an assistant ops because they didn't know what to do with me initially. And I cannot describe to you the sense of like sitting around with Navy SEALs that are the best at that job who have gone on high profile missions we've all heard about. And it's not just the SEALs. Everybody at that command was incredible what they did. Intelligence, analysts, communicators, cybersecurity, everything you can imagine, they get the best of the best to go there. And the pace of operations is frenetic. And I remember one of the SEALs who was like an ops leader looking at me going, hey, can you work on this? And I just had this confused face. And he had that, it it wasn't mean at all, but he was frustrated because he was overloaded with work and he needed somebody who could help like make some briefs and stuff. And I wanted to do it. I just didn't know how. Anyway, so that like whatever you can imagine that feeling is where you're like, I have thought I worked hard for the last eight years. Like I went to like a pretty decently hard college and I can move font size. Like I don't even know enough to like change the words or move this around. And then I figured out how to be valuable. But the reality is that I kept a straight face and looked confident as much as I could during the day. And then I would like cry at night. So what I learned is how over my life doing a lot of those things, but that's one of the more dramatic, being new and starting something. Because that's, if you're raising your hand to be a leader, you're in some way doing something new and out of character. You see something that you believe needs to be changed. And so you're going against the grain in large ways or small. And it means that it's going to feel uncomfortable. So I just got used to the feeling of discomfort and saw that as familiar rather than, oh, I feel uncomfortable. I don't know what I'm doing yet. That must mean I can't do it. So I won't. I just, I've gotten really, really comfortable with the feeling of discomfort. All right. So this, let's stay here. So a lot of people have discomfort and they freeze, they paralyze, they stop moving. Yeah. yeah. So what have you learned about how to stay moving when you're uncomfortable? 
because that's how you've gotten to where you are now. But what's actually going on for Ann Gibbon when you realize font size is the best move I've got now, and yeah. that's not good enough, and I need to move from here to someplace? How, how do you actually mobilize your head, your heart, your guts, your body yeah. in the face of that? Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? I'll put a disclaimer in. Go ahead. That somewhere inside of you, if you got to the point that you needed to raise your hand and you couldn't just sit by and watch something anymore, it was so uncomfortable that you had to put yourself in that position. And now you're in this moment and you feel like you want to freeze. I go back to the voice. For me, there's a voice inside that just fucking screams that I am a motherfucker. So I choose to say what feels decently vulnerable that I would work at the SEAL team and at night go home and cry sometimes and eat cookies because you just, especially around those people, you just want to put on your war face all the time. But what I know is true that no matter if I cried at night and I could only change the font size in the beginning, I am a motherfucker. And that fucking voice would scream in my head louder. And sometimes it was just slightly louder than the desire to stay frozen and quiet. Because what quiet is and frozen is just, please don't notice me. I don't want to get this wrong. I don't want the attention of separation from whatever community. Like we're all social creatures and designed for connection. And so that freezing is just, you don't want to be separated, but there is something greater in you than this fear of a temporary disconnection. And it's this truth. And for me, it's this voice that screams. And so, I don't know, it was a few months into the work there. And there's a group of us going into one of the big conference rooms to do a, a video teleconference and participate in a brief. And so we're standing outside, I'm in camis, waiting to go in. And one of the people there was the senior enlisted, it wasn't Dave, but it was a senior enlisted at that command. Anyway, so the number one enlisted person in charge of this SEAL team. And he was like, oh, Anne, I knew you were really smart, but like, I didn't, I didn't know that you were a boxer too. That's really cool. Tell me about it. We're all kind of jovial and we're carrying like PowerPoints and stuff, but we're always around SEALs. So I didn't say anything. I've got, for being a heavyweight boxer, I've got a really good first step. I was a, several feet away. So I just moved really fast and threw a punch that landed an inch from his face. And he was like, yeah, no, uh. No, I believe you. Got it. Good. Uh, so I'm imagining people who are listening. Imagine my daughter. Yeah. Who's, oh, nearly 30 living in New York. She just ran the marathon in Paris last week. So Congratulations. I'm yeah, it was, it was sweet. But I'm imagining people listening to this and thinking about what you've just said. So that works for Ann Gibbon is what they're going to say. Yeah. But I'm me and I'm different and I didn't go to the Naval Academy and I don't understand this technology stuff, but I'm trying to figure out my way forward. So since we are all different, but you've been around a lot of different people and seen a lot of different ways to approach the things that you're talking about. How do you speak to those people if you're in the front of a room of a bunch of people who want to use themselves more effectively to lead? But they're all different and they all have different kinds of motors. What's the common DNA that you think you can tap into there that will help all of them, but it'll be different for each of them? I actually feel like I I want to counter that. I don't want to try to say something that talks to everybody mm. because I can't, it's just what you said. I can't know their experience. I don't know where they're coming from and I don't know what they want to do with their lives. I only know what's true for me. So that's why I tell the stories like this is the reality, the fun parts, the the sad parts. But one of the things that I turn to, and I've seen this work for others, I learned it when I was in New Zealand. I, I worked for some Maori tribes. And the military does an incredible job of showing you your place in a legacy. Really, like it it makes you feel in some ways some often anonymous. You put on a uniform and you look like all the others. And your job is to serve both the mission, but you also get a sense of like, this is the long legacy. You know, your ships are named after people who have won Medal of Honor, towns in America, and battles that have been fought decades and decades prior. You're always very aware of the people who came before and served with honor and that you wear the same uniform and you have to uphold that legacy. But it doesn't necessarily give you a place 
yourself, like where's my identity in this and mm-hmm. and where's the future? But when I was in New Zealand, I got the other side of that lesson, which was there is such honor placed on ancestors and knowing those stories You never introduce yourself as just this is my name and who I am in my life, because of course, you didn't emerge from nothing. You came from somewhere, a place and a people. So you always introduce yourself with this is my family and my tribe and my place. This is my mountain, my river. And the work that they do, they constantly talked about seven generations ahead. And so you knew that no matter how imperfectly you did it, that your life's work should be about a positive effect for the next seven generations. And you acknowledge that you came from the seven generations back. And so it gives a sense of, oh, I'm not alone. And there's a purpose to this work. And it's not like my name is a fancy legacy and the name on a bench or a building at my university. It's I am one link in this chain. And I am part of a chain, but I'm just one link. So I think I don't have personal the advice that I like want to say to others listening to this. And I think about your daughter, I want to point to others who have, I think, perfected the advice. And I look at indigenous people and my major experience with indigenous culture is with my Maori friends. And it was the honor of my lifetime to get to work for them and go into their homes and see their participate in rituals and know their culture. And so I think if in your own life, you can find what that chain is. And for me, it's many things. It's my family. And like I mentioned, my grandparents, it's also the place that I'm from. I love the mountain ranges, like the Olympics and the Cascades and the Puget Sound define so much of even my psychology. I love that area, but so does the military, the Navy. There's so many places that I've come from that are my chain. And that is, in the end is the thing that has gotten me every time that I want to freeze. It's the thing that unsticks me is if I conceive of myself as alone, I want to freeze because that's terrifying. If I think of myself as just one link in a greater chain, then I feel much more free to go figure something out and keep moving forward. When you talk about the way you're talking and and thinking about the past generations and future generations, you take me to a place and just some reading I was doing the other day, but this issue of climate change, I know this may be a little bit outside of your core focus, but we are clearly not all that interested in future generations and what they may inhabit given the way in which we're going about addressing climate change now in, in spite of all the hard data we've got that we're really tracking in, in a really poor direction. Yeah. So do you have thoughts on this? I mean, you know, you're involved in a lot of things and we're in a weird place right now. And we don't seem to be able to capture people's attention with the information that we're producing that would cause behavior change that could alter the direction we're going. So is there anything up your sleeve with the work you're doing that might help with this cause? Please, please. Yeah. Yeah. This is why I love the company that we're building because what we want to make it easier for everybody, whether it's experts. So somebody who's a a scientist or just a citizen trying to understand their community and the likelihood of flooding and erosion around where they live and wildfires. We want to make it easier for people to consume information and understand it. And if you can only see a straw, a few things about that, it is much harder to understand a complex system and the many pieces of your world, whatever you're looking at. So climate, your environment, where you live, whatever your role is, whether you're a citizen or a scientist, what we're building is a a visualization tool that makes it easier to see a lot of information, but in a way that's consumable. So it makes sense. It's not just impossible. So visualization will will end up being more like immersive gaming than a kind of dry dashboard with a lot of little pieces. I think What it enables people to do is not see bits of disconnected data that you have to work paradoxically when you see a little bit of information, like on a dashboard. It's just, here's a little trend line. Here's a histogram. Here's some scatter plot. Here's here's just a couple numbers. Your brain has to end up working a lot harder to bring that information together to make meaning about your world. Because 
it may look pretty like graphically it's nice colors it's kind of nice design like segmented but to actually make it mean something to you and then change your behavior or bring you to some new insight it's actually harder work to look at that than it is to look at some of the things we're designing because we're taking a different approach to showing information so i say we can show you more but we do that in a way where different data points are linked together so they're now concepts. So when we like show people, we're starting off with sports. When we show scouts information about players, they can see a couple dozen parameters per player. And to some people that would be overwhelming, but they're experts in that sport and they know the data that's available pretty decently well. They definitely know the concept of all the things that that player is doing. Like if it's baseball, all the aspects of hitting and fielding and pitching of the game itself over innings, teams playing and going back and forth. So they can look at that information the way we're showing it. And they are actually seeing dozens of data parameters. So it's a lot more data than you'd see in another tool, but it's easier to consume and make sense of because it fits their concepts of how they already understand that system, mm -hmm. players and all these different kinds of the data about the game. And so when I think about what we're doing and why I say I'm like, you know, 20 years away from my goal, like I'm, this is my life. There's no, like this got too hard and I'm walking away. And when I we put for ourselves something really audacious, like we want to revolutionize how humans consume information and use information. It's because I want to get into the thornier, exciting things, whether that's, we say climate change, but really what that is, it's just managing our environment, whatever is true. And so at a community level, that could be like managing storm drains and runoff and voting on local policies about, I don't know that you vote on flood insurance, but flooding and allocating budgets to protect a community. So if you can see more information about your community, then you are much more likely to have a sense of like relative risk and opportunity by allocating budget. And you can model predicted weather patterns. You can look at historical data. So we're going to make it easier for people to see information in a way that makes sense to them, that kind of reflects in that digital world what they're seeing in their environment. But you're only looking at your environment out the window. I'm looking out the window here second by second. But when you look at this kind of twin world of data, you can look at historical patterns for days, weeks, months, decades to predictions of what might be. So does that make sense? It does make sense. And you said something, there's no too hard and I'm walking away. And you also made mention, you know, this is your life, 20 more years, maybe. Yeah, for sure. So most people don't have this kind of clarity that the road ahead is going to be this challenging. And yeah. that, that is what they're facing every day when they get up and get started. If they did have that clarity, they probably would figure out another option. They would figure out another alternative for a lot of people, not everybody. For you, what's the dynamic between the pull of what the possibility is and the push to keep moving forward? How do you use both of those yeah. to, to keep yourself in motion and sustain an optimistic and a belief that we're going to get there? Yeah, partly because I've done this before. So my dad really wanted us kids to go to military academies and he took us, our family vacations were essentially marketing opportunities. So one year we went to the Air Force Academy to see the July 4th fireworks. I think I was 11. For whatever reason, I thought the, the only thing you could do at the Air Force Academy was fly and be a cook. I do not know how I came up with that. And neither one of those appealed. And when I was in the fall of my freshman year in high school, we visited the East Coast and the only reservations my dad had for all the historical things that you could imagine, touristy things you might want to see on the East Coast, the only things my dad had reserved were football games at West Point and at Navy. And there's a lot of other stuff we ended up seeing because we could fit it in around the marketing tour. And I just remember after walking around, it was a beautiful fall day. I still remember sitting in the hotel room that night and I had the sense of, oh, I'm going to the Naval Academy. And I also knew I wasn't thinking about it. I was just knowing it. It was a truth. And I also had this thought in my head. 
I can't even conceive of what that means for me right now. I don't understand the implications. I just know I'm doing this. And so for the next four years of high school, I did everything possible to make a good application to go to the Naval Academy. I read everything I could get my hands on and talk to people that had applied and gotten in. And then that's an incredible decision to go to the Naval Academy because of the time scale involved. So I was 14. I knew I wanted to go there. So that's another two years or four years. It takes you to 22. But then if you go there, you owe an obligation of five to take you at least to 27. So I knew when I was 14 that I was I just had a knowing and I never wavered when I was in high school. I knew that I was committing to something that would take me to at least 27 when I was 14. So I've had this experience before where Mm -hmm. I recognize the feeling inside once I get to like, oh, I know I'm doing this. It took me until I was 37 ish, 38 to find this work now. And to know, okay, when I talked with my co-founder, he'd been a friend for a long time, but he said, let's build a company together. So when that, like, it took, you know, I don't know, months or years, I don't know, maybe it took seconds, but it took some time to sink in and to know in my bones that this was my commitment in life. So anyway, that's where I got to. I recognize the feeling inside because I've had it before that the scale of what we want to do cannot be accomplished in a short time period. And it can't be accomplished if I am an average version of me. And it may not be accomplished if I can get myself to be the best version of me. But the only chance we have at doing this is if, at least on my end, if I am every day, I'm finding the next best version of what I can be. And so when I say like too hard, there's nothing in the outside world that can bring itself to be too hard. The hardest thing in the world is to every day find the edge of what you're capable of and know that if you want to do the thing that you've set out for yourself, not everybody uses this phrase, but I use it. I have to burn myself down every day to be a better version tomorrow. And that's painful every day because every day I'm finding the things that I need to improve. Okay. So I almost want to stop here, but you just ended with a very provocative descriptor. I have to burn myself down. What does that mean in in your world when the day ends? What does that actually mean for people listening? All the comfort I have of I'm doing a good job or I'm smart or people like me because there can be a tendency to hide in the comfort of I'm already good enough. I don't need to push myself a little bit harder, like whatever this is that I'm doing, whatever, in whatever way, like, you know, I have to do sales, I have to do product design, I have to figure out the financial management, financial modeling, all of the stuff that I have to do to build a company. It can be tempting to fall on, well, this is good enough because whatever I am is comfortable and growth is often painful. And so I say burn it down because I try to burn down the places in which I find false comfort. And in that fire, which is this, you know, it's painful, but it's also energy, it's clarifying, and you get to the essence of something. So I try and burn down those places of false comfort, and I look for the truth of what I need to work on, and also, you know, like what's going right. And then I use that to drive me forward. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being you. And thank you for sharing your stories and your wisdom about how to navigate this crazy, messed up world. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to 10,000 Swamp Leaders with Rick Torset. Please take this moment and hit subscribe to follow more Leadership Swamp Conversations. 